Guy Massey, welcome back to Abbey Road Studios and thank you for joining us today. Pleasure, nice to be back. We're here to talk about the Waves Abbey Road plates. Yeah. And um, we have four plates here at Abbey Road, which I'm, you're pretty familiar with. You've seen some action with them over the years, I believe. Yes, yeah, <laughs> quite a long time ago, but uh, yeah, uh, 10 years I was here. So most sessions, we would, uh, we would definitely plug them up if, if uh, the classical boys would let us have them, <laughs> which wasn't often. When I started here, I was like probably assisting for about five years, I guess. And I was working with John Leckie and we worked on Radiohead's The Bends. And he mixed that in here. It subsequently went on to be sort of some of it remixed, but he would always use the plate or a plate. We'd have one or two of them go in. I did Ian Grimble on The Manic Street Pictures, Everything Must Go. And that was lots of reverb on that record. And that would have been the plates for sure. And we probably had the chamber, um, two's chamber hooked up as well. So, and then everything subsequently, when I, when I became engineer myself, you know, a lot of the Beatles stuff that I did, I would have definitely used the plates for when we did the anthology. Um, Paul Hicks and I, we were in Studio 2, as you know, for a long, long time, and we would have used the plates a lot there. Um, and when I did uh, Surround for Help, I would have definitely used it. Um, probably not, you know, really up front, but it would have been in there for sure. Um, so every session. I was thinking back to before the plates came on the scene here at Abbey Road, 1957, I think they were first released out to the general public. 57, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Abbey Road bought four. Now, before those plates existed, your only option to change um, the sound of your recording acoustically was to use an echo chamber. Yeah. Um, and there were three echo chambers here in Abbey Road, Studio One, Studio Two, Studio Three, they each had their own dedicated echo chambers. But that's obviously bricks and mortar, right? That's like four walls and a microphone and a speaker, you can't change the reverb time as such. There's not much you can actually play with. So before the plates, your options were really limited. I mean, the chambers sounded absolutely amazing, but they, they are, you know, they were they, what they are. So yeah, it must have been quite, uh, quite shocking in some ways to be able to manipulate sounds in, in, in such a way or, or put them in spaces um, that maybe, uh, you know, don't exist, as it were. But I guess having four here, that do sonically sound quite different was, was a good sort of springboard for, for new sort of techniques and new sounds. Beatles wise, I think they, was, they started to get used a lot more uh, from Sergeant Pepper onwards. I think they saw quite a lot of use on Sergeant Pepper. Right, okay. Uh, and then obviously by the time you get into like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, etc., I mean, they were, they were used quite heavily throughout those recordings, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, putting voices and instruments in, in these spaces that, you know, were never really used before, you know, I think it's, it, they definitely informs the way you mix and I guess produce in lots of ways as well, because you can, you know, really change the landscape with, with, with long reverbs, I think, which to a really pleasing effect. Yeah, it's interesting to note that even though they kind of originally were deemed as artificial sounding, the classical guys actually did start to use them quite a lot and um, they saw quite a lot of action on well, film scores, obviously, um, but yeah. also cl straight out classical and orchestral recordings as well. I think so, yeah. I mean, I think, as I said earlier, you know, when I was on, um, when I first started out and I was assisting mixing or stuff, you, 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 they'd say, oh, can we have a couple of the plates? And you go in there, they'd always be plugged into Studio One, so you'd have to go down and beg to, uh, to use them on sessions. And A, A and D, I do remember being the ones that I'd always sort of choose or recommend. When you think of a plate reverb, what, what, what does that mean to you? What's special about a plate? I guess for me, uh, when I worked here, having the luxury of four different plates, which all had very different sort of sonic imprints, I guess. Um, the main thing that it carried through for me was the, uh, the depth that you could get from them. Um, you know, they could really make a, quite a, an ordinary sounding instrument or voice have this, be put in this completely new space. So the fact that you could have, you know, pretty dry, almost room-like sounds and then huge uh, hall-type sounds with them was what impressed me the most about them. And um, yeah, just the, and the smoothness of them, more than anything, was what was you know, impressive. A little bit temperamental sometimes, I believe. A bit noisy. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, the, it was never stuff that you couldn't get rid of. It was generally sort of main sum, wasn't it, I think, that yeah. there was the major issue and you just sort of filter all that off below 60 hertz and you were, you were laughing, I think. Um, and a bit, yeah, a bit hissy, maybe. Um, but I think 
um, was it CRL? It was the, yeah. the, the company yeah. they did. They did mod them, didn't they? Yeah, um, uh, central research laboratories for uh, EMI. Yeah, yeah, they were always trying to keep the noise down. Yeah. Um, they they took two valves away. Okay. And, and transistorized okay. Um, half the amp, so it's like a hybrid. Okay. And they only did it for three plates, and then plate D is it's is full fully valve. valve. Yeah. And that was what primarily to get rid of the the hum and the hiss. It's, yeah, or? trying to keep the noise. They've always been. Plates have got, uh, that are known historically to be a bit sort of temperamental. Yeah, um, yeah. I was always calling up Lester and sort of saying, you know, plate D's humming again. Or he, he got, I don't know what he did up there, but he got up to the plate room and adjust kick a few it. things. Yeah, probably kick it, yeah. Turn, um, turn it off, turn it on again. We don't get that on the plug-in, obviously, of course. Obviously not, no. You can, he, you can crank it back in again if you want. But, um, <laughs> no, I notice you can dial in the noise to, to as much as you like, sort yeah. of thing, or, or take it all away. Yeah. It's always nice to have a little bit in there, I think, because it just makes it sound realer, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the um, their natural state is that when you first open the plug-in, they sound as they naturally do. Yeah. Obviously, if they've been tweaked to perfection as they do. Um, but, yeah, if you want more hiss, you can add more hiss and, or get rid of it entirely. <laughs> so they say no plate sounds the same. They're quite um, sort of uh, unique sounding at every plate. Um, you've got a lot going on inside mechanically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how do the Abbey Road plates sound to you? Um, what, what's going on there? They are very different, and I guess that's to do with the tensioning of the plates, because you were saying that they haven't been changed, I believe, um, the actual tensions of them. Yeah, yeah, the amps get tweaked quite a lot, um, but actually opening them up and getting inside, I mean, we, we make sure they sound good and that nothing obviously disastrously wrong is going on, but yeah. we kind of let we let them kind of stay as they are, as they have done since the late 50s. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why people use them, you know, because they do sound... I mean, if you, if you mess with them, then you're messing with history a bit, aren't you? Yeah. Um, but what I found was, uh, for me, plate D, and I do recall this being the same uh, when I was here, was the one I always went for, and that's the all-valve one, I believe. So that's really... has a real warmth to it, loads of low-end, um, a real depth to it, which I really like. Whereas plate C is a lot brighter. So maybe you would veer to using plate C for, for vocal reverbs or snare reverbs, something like that. If you wanted to darken a sound up, you'd maybe go with, with D a bit more. Um, so they all do sound very different. I guess that is down to, I mean, you know, manufacturing in the 50s, I guess those plates, I mean, there might be tiny little sort of inconsistencies in the thickness and the finish and things like that. And then the tensioning would be um, something that I would imagine would um, you know, change the sound quite a lot. Um, and then the dampening as well. Um, I noticed that plate A on, on, on lower position seems to be longer than the other three. Um, so I don't know if its longest position is, is you know, a lot longer, but definitely when it was on three or two, it sounds like almost twice as long as the others. So maybe that's you know, an inconsistency with the tension or something like that, but that's been modelled perfectly as well, I think. That's all part of the unique charm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> yeah. And the fact that they're all so different is, yeah. is what's cool about it. Yeah, totally, yeah. Plate C for vocals, I love it on vocals. Uh, plate A is really great for, um, like, synths, um, just sort of, like, adding a bit of life to uh, okay. sort of pads and stuff like that. I, I find it's... It yeah it does wonders for yeah that sort of stuff. The, the low mids on on A are really they they go on for a long when you got it on like nine or ten mm. they go on for a long time yeah. they do sound good actually yeah creates yeah. a really nice sense of space yeah definitely. So this is where the plates are housed up here on the roof. Okay, I always thought they were downstairs in behind studio two, but. Must have been ages ago then. Yeah, they, they were for a bit. Yeah, they're mm. down in Studio Two's echo chamber for a bit, and then Studio Two's echo chamber got uh, put back into commission, as it were. I think that was back in the mid nineties. Okay. okay. Uh, for the anthology, actually, I think. So maybe a little bit yeah. earlier. Yeah. So they got moved up here, which is Studio One's old echo chamber. And this is what you were talking about earlier, with the the amps have been pulled out. Yeah, um, Lester sort of worked out that if, if you have the, have the amps out of the actual unit themselves, they're supposed to go in these um, holes here. Yeah. Um, it kind of just brings all the noise down a bit, um, especially the hum, it really okay. helps. Okay. Um, and there's the all-valve jobby. Yes, this, this is plate D, the all-valve plate, and the three, three hybrids. Three hybrids, yeah. yeah. And then 
remote controls goes down into room 2A. You must remember room 2A. I do, oh, yeah. And, and these, because so, they used to be the wheels, yeah? So these I think been... there was a wheel on top on the original ones, yeah, and they, these have been modded. Okay, so that, they just move the dampeners in and out? Yes, yeah. And they're remote control from 2A yeah. still. Right, yeah. got you. Uh, room 2A. <laughs> you remember this room, right? I do, yes, yeah. yes. I remember those. The remote controls to the plates. Indeed. It's like a central patch room for the entire building, so you can obviously control the plates from here, which are up on the roof. Um, but you can also patch um, Studio 2's echo chamber to any other room in the building. Uh, each studio's got tie lines, so you could put microphones down in Studio 1 and patch those microphones up to the Penthouse Mix Studio, for example. So it's like a, it's like a hub, like a central hub of the entire building. Each plate has got a remote control, so um, the engineer doesn't have to go up to the roof every time they want to um, adjust the plate uh, to make the reverb time longer or shorter. You just come into this room um, and Yep, you just hold your button down, um, keep it down until you get it to the sort of length you want it. I love the initials that have been left here over the years. Yeah, I recognise uh, uh, AM, that would have been Alex Marku, and that would have been a couple of years after I started. Okay. Who else? John Kurlander, JK. JK. Peter Cobbin, when was that? 2003. Uh, that may have been the anthology, perhaps, 2003. Yeah, it would have been, yeah. I was always a bit of a Luddite when it came to plugins. I'll be very honest about that. But since Waves have come to the fore and, and their modelling is, you know, second to none, I'm far less sniffy about it. Um, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, if you asked me to use a digital EQ or compressor, I'd have been, I'd, I'd have said no. Um, but now you listen to them and the modelling is so good that I think today's proved to me that I can't tell the difference between the original because you've, you've recorded some of the original sounds for me with the plate, and then I've used the plug-in and listened to exactly the same material, Unity Gain, all the rest of it. And I'd be hard-pressed to, to tell the difference, to be honest with you.